Uh, welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes uh, for everyone to get settled and then we'll get started. Uh, but do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're from and why you've come along today, if you'd like. Hi, everyone. We will get going properly shortly. Um, just giving it a couple of minutes for everyone to arrive. Uh, do introduce yourselves in the chat in the meantime. I'll give it a tiny bit longer and uh, then we'll get going, but uh, do use the chat to say hello and introduce yourselves just before we start. Great, I might uh, kick us off. I'm sure a few other people will arrive, but uh, I'm sure they'll catch up. So um, hello, everyone, and a good afternoon from North London and a good morning, afternoon or evening to you, wherever you may be today. Welcome to Unlocking Civic Tech Impact, Reflections on Tick Tech Labs, organised by my society and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy. I'm Gavin Freegard, a freelance consultant working with my society on the Tick Tech Labs programme. Among other things, I'm also an associate at the Institute for Government, interim head of public policy at the Open Data Institute and a policy associate at Connected by Data here in the UK. I will be your chair, facilitator and host for today's event. Uh, do tell us who you are and why you're here in the chat if you'd like. It's wonderful to have so many of you with us today. Now, over the next couple of hours, we're going to look back at the Tick Tech Labs programme, which has sought to identify some of the common challenges facing civic tech organisations globally, think about what could help solve some of those challenges and uh, commission some solutions to them. We'll be showcasing the work of all six organisations that we awarded subgrants to as part of the programme, and then reflecting on how everything went with some members of our steering group. Some quick housekeeping first. Today's event is on the record. It's being recorded and we will be publishing it online afterwards, along with a write-up of today's event. You should be able to access a live transcript here on Zoom. Do let us know in the chat if you can't. You're very welcome to share details of the event on social media. It's hashtag TicTech. And if you'd like to contribute to today's discussion at any point, you can use the chat here on Zoom. And there might be some opportunity later to unmute your mic and tell us what you're thinking as well. Now, shortly, I'm going to give a quick overview of what we did with Tic Tac Labs and how today's event will run. But first, I'm delighted to hand over to my society's chief executive, Louise, for a few words. Louise. Thanks, Gavin. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am going to keep my introductory comments very brief as I and I'm sure you all are keen to get onto the presentations and the discussion. Um, but I thought anyone not familiar with Tic Tech might be wondering about the name Tic Tech Labs. Uh, so Tic Tech stands for the Impacts of Civic Technology Conference. Uh, a very brief history of the conference. It's a conference that my society has been running since 2015 aiming to convene an international mix of researchers, practitioners, policymakers, philanthropists, sometimes even tech giants, trying to understand how civic technology is shaping society and really asking the question, how do we learn from each other? How do we develop some kind of evidence base about what's working in the common goals that we have to help people participate, ensure transparency and accountability? Uh, that conference series went rapidly online in March 2020, as you all may remember, and in 2021 we ran a series of online show and tell events really tailored to the shortened attention spans and online fatigue that everybody had during that time. 
But by 2022, we were really aware that the pandemic had weakened networks, particularly internationally. We were missing the more informal conversations you have in a corridor or a conference. But we'd also learned how online events could open up opportunities for participation around the world. And that was really the origin of the idea for Tic Tech Labs, as Gavin said, aiming to bring people together, strengthen networks, help us exchange ideas and support the development of new initiatives. So it's absolutely brilliant to be able to see the fruits of that work. And I just want to thank everyone who's participated, hundreds of different people. You've made it a hugely interesting, informative and enjoyable experience. And thank you also to National Endowment for Democracy for supporting this work. And having said that, I'm going to hand right back to Gavin to uh, say on with the show. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, that was a really helpful, quick introduction um, to uh, Tech Tech Labs program. I, I, I say introduction, uh, given quite a few of you will have interacted with the program already in various ways. I suppose it's uh, a reminder as much as anything else. Um, as Louise said, the aim of Tech Tech Labs was to discuss and tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the global civic tech and digital democracy sector. Uh, we wanted to grow the evidence base, address some of the key issues, and enhance the effectiveness and potential impact of civic tech projects. Uh, Louise talked about the history of Tic Tech, the impacts of Civic Technology Conference, uh, and you can see uh, on, you've got a visual representation of that uh, on the screen. And obviously, as you've heard, we went online uh, for various reasons uh, from 2020 onwards. So, um, We've got on this slide um, some details of our steering group. You can see them on the right, and you'll be hearing from a couple of them later. Uh, they helped identify six big challenges common to civic tech around the world. And you can see those challenges on the left. They were public-private collaborations, ensuring accessibility of civic tech, accessing quality information, storytelling and reach, learning from climate action, how can civic tech drive impactful societal change, and civic tech in hostile environments. Um, as many of you will know, for each of those six topics, we organised a civic tech surgery, which delved into some of the common challenges. After each surgery, we then convened an action lab, a small working group of around six people. They thought more about the possible solutions that people had thought about at the civic tech surgery, and then helped commission a piece of work to help solve some of the challenges raised. And that led to the award of a subgrant. I think we now have a completed project, insofar as anything uh, is ever completed, for each of those six topics. Now, today's event, uh, after this introduction, will begin with us hearing from each of those subgrant projects. We have people powered on public-private collaborations, Technoloxia on ensuring civic tech is accessible, Open North on accessing quality information, <clears throat> excuse me, Fundathi on Multitudes on storytelling and reach, the Demography Project on driving impactful societal change, and Policy Lab Africa on civic tech in hostile environments. Each of them will have 10 minutes to present. There is going to be a timer on screen uh, to keep us all to time as well. And then once all of them are presented, we'll have up to 20 minutes to put questions to them as a group for some discussion. After that, we'll end with a panel discussion between Louise and two of our steering group members, Isabel and Matt, on what went well with Tic Tech Labs, how well we think it achieved its aims, and what we can learn from it. So without further ado, we'll move to our first presentation. Um, remember, we'll be taking questions uh, to all of our presenters at the very end, so feel free to discuss things in the chat and add questions as we go along um, and any reflections that you might have. And our first presenter is going to be Pam from People Powered. So Pam, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Director of Communications for People Powered. And um, I am going to talk about public-private collaborations, but I'm going to uh, add a further focus. Um, one of the challenges we have at People Powered, you know, we People Powered focuses on all types of participatory democracy and, and using civic tech to enable that. The problem um, I noticed as soon as I started at People Powered, which is about a year and a half ago, is that we talk an awful lot about process and not enough about people. Because honestly, if people aren't benefiting in their daily lives in some way, then what's the point of what we're doing? So um, what I when we got this small grant from Tic Tech, um, we set out uh, to to actually figure out how could we tell story. Let's see, hold on, this is not. Yeah, there. Um, uh, how could we how could we tell a story 
um, about, about the work that we do. Um, and and I, I want to remind people, so when I say story, I'm going to sort of define what I mean by story, because I think we use that word sort of generically and, and a lot of misunderstanding occurs. Um, when I say story, I mean really answering the question of so, so what, who cares? Um, and the, the way to best do that is through stories. And that means people, putting people and the problems, the real everyday uh, uh, everyday problems they face at the very center of, of what we do. And, the, and the, to me, the process, the civic tech is really a tool to get there. It's not the focus or shouldn't be the focus. So um, this is a reminder, we tend to spend most of our time on the process, not enough time on the people. People care about people and the challenges um, and what challenges it enables them. So um, I'm just gonna walk through. So when I when we got the grant and we, we realized what we wanted to do is we, we really had to collaborate with, um, with, with other partners because People Powered is an organization that doesn't actually do this work on the ground. People Powered um, networks together, trains, funds, supports organizations and people around the world who are trying to promote spirit democracy in their kind of local context. So if we want to tell the story of what differences, so what, who cares? we have to partner with a number of other organizations because they're the ones on the ground actually seeing it happen. So it's really necessary for us to partner. And so I set out uh, when we got this small grant thinking that this is, uh, I, I said, said the anatomy of a story. I wanted to be able to tell a story that had people, characters. So I mean, think, think about a novel, think about a movie. It has characters, that there's a conflict or a challenge that they face and there's a plot line a narrative arc that tells the tale of how they tackled it. So I actually come from a background of creative writing and storytelling. So I sort of believe if we apply more of this framework to how we communicate, we'll all be more interesting. So I wanna sort of break that down a little bit and show how it, how it applied to the stories that we developed with this grant. So when I said it's people at the heart, <clears throat> one of the uh, biggest points of pushback I often get when I start on this is it really needs, we need to have find a person, not people, not a huge audience, but a person um, to, to put at the heart of the story. People often resist that because it's hard to find one person who obviously is representative of everybody. And we're all concerned about diversity, you know, and obviously if you pick one person, it's, well, that's a female, that's a, that person is this race or not that race, whatever. But we're looking at this as a collection of stories. And um, there's plenty of research that shows that people respond in a different way when they're presented with the plight of a person, one person that they can relate to and not um, a, you know, a big audience. Uh, so we're basically using the story to tell the story of, of a larger group. So which person you choose to tell the story uh, th 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 through whose eyes you tell, depends on what uh, um, the story you want to tell. What's the purpose of your story? What, which audience you're trying to reach? It could be um, an employee of a civil society organization, who now has a drive, you know, has a drive to see real participation in her city. And this process that you're talking about, the civic tech uh, tool allowed that to happen. It could be a local government staffer um, who has long wanted to see marginalized people including in decision-making. And again, this enables him to do it. Um, the, I, I put this picture here um, because the story that I'm going to walk through is from Chile. And um, it's, a good, it's a good example because Civic tech was really a tool as part of a larger mission. Um, and in the case of Chile, it was, um, they wanted uh, more, they had a situation where a lot of youth in the country were not engaged uh, and they were not seeing themselves as future leaders of the country. So the, there was a, uh, actually a, a youth initiative developed in which case, uh, which young people could participate, propose projects that would help their communities, participate in a leadership development uh, project and um, an online tool uh, was, was chosen to enable the participation of a lot of youth from across the country who perhaps couldn't travel. So this, this picture, uh, the arrow is pointing to the, the gentleman in the, in the middle. He is the person who we chose to feature in this story. Um, he is the young person who felt sort of um, disengaged in the beginning because he was working in a very rural area of the country. And the youth project um, allowed him to uh, submit ideas and to see it. he ended up having his project chosen. So he felt very empowered. He is now a future leader. Um, I'm going to return to the, the weaknesses of this photo later on in the presentation, but uh, it, it gives the idea that we chose a person in the beginning. 
And we didn't choose, no, no, we didn't choose somebody in this case who was working for the government youth agency. Uh, we chose the sort of an ultimate beneficiary. Um, now there has to be a problem or, or a conflict. Uh, what the problem that he faced in the rural, he is a, a physician in a rural area of the country. And what he was seeing around him was these um, a very poor population uh, who worked in very harsh conditions out in the fields, extreme sun. And so as a physician, he was treating a lot of sun-related illnesses. So he was thinking, how can I, how can I help them? I don't have the resources though. I have some ideas of what needs to be done, but that's why he submitted a project through this, this youth initiative about how to address this, this, um, this issue. So when you get to know that these, these people he's treating in his community, that sort of answers the so what. Um, you end up getting to know, and this photo is, I think is wonderful. You sort of see into his eyes and you start to get a feel for the type of people he cares for. Then you get to the solution and there's a narrative arc in between. It connects the solution to the problem. Uh, and that's where the civic tech comes in <laughs> because it's civic tech that, that connects, that allows that problem to be connected to the solution. Now you actually see the solution in the photo. Um, there was many other things he did, but one, one was very simple, was providing them all hats. Um, there was also a number of other things he did in terms of skin cancer screening, et cetera. Um, but again, it, it's each story um, has a beginning in the middle and an end. You have to think about it that way. Now, uh, one of the other big problems with the storytelling in our space is that um, wins are sometimes very long in coming. Policy changes are very long in coming. Sometimes they don't work. So uh, the, the end can really be maybe one step and there's gonna be many more ends along the way, many more successes. It could just be somebody who was never engaged with government before and now feels like they can pick up the phone and call somebody. You know, that can be a win right there. So remember the successes can be defined in many different ways. So the path to solution in this case, it was, it was uh, Citizen Lab was the, was the platform that was used. And this allowed all these youth from across the country to submit their idea and have everybody to be able to evaluate it, interact with it, like it, you know, no matter where they were. And it was, it was actually, so it, without that, it probably wouldn't have happened. So that was just one of the stories. Uh, we did um, three others. Uh, there was Kyrgyzstan and the platform in this case was Your Priorities. Um, the, the person was uh, that we chose in this case. So the problem, I'm gonna jump to the problem really quickly. This was the World Bank was the partner and they were working across Europe to build this um, massive new power line that was going to go through a lot of rural communities. That was gonna happen no matter what. <laughs> um, and they knew it was gonna be sort of disruptive. So they didn't want the, the rural villagers to feel like they were totally at the mercy of. They said, how can we involve them in choosing their own projects that will help improve their communities as the power line goes in? Um, so they, that's, and that's where the, this on, the online platform came in. So we chose one young woman, a 20 year old resident in one of those rural communities who as a youth and as a woman, uh, she really had felt like she had no voice in this. She felt like this power line is gonna go in no matter what. So what's the point? But through this whole process, which by the way, wasn't just civic tech, in all these cases, there was a lot of um, on the ground in-person uh, communication that was true for everybody. But the online, I mean, what was interesting in this case was that a lot of the um, women in rural conservative communities wouldn't feel comfortable going out of the house or wouldn't be allowed to go out of the house. So, uh, but they all had, um, you know, phone connectivity through their phones. So um, this was the, the really enabling part of the technology, the civic tech in this case, is women otherwise might not have been involved in the decision-making process at all. And um, Sinbai, uh, she actually went in, she also, she became so involved and so engaged that she would go into homes in the rural communities and train them with other women how to use the technology. Um, and so as a result, yeah, they all, they, they chose like, you know, we need more wells, we need more, uh, electricity to go to more communities. So what happened was, is that the power line went in, but along with it, there was a lot of improvements that were, that were enabled at the same time. Oh, wait, whoops. Let me go back. So uh, yeah, so another one was China. Now China was sort of different because uh, they didn't use a sophisticated uh, participatory democracy plat digital platform. They used WeChat, which is, I think, something important to remember. Sometimes 
It doesn't take some brand new sophisticated platform. They use something that was already in use. WeChat is extremely uh, popular. Everybody's used to using WeChat and they decided it would be better to create a mini applet that would operate within WeChat. So they didn't have to get people used to going to a whole new platform. So the person we chose in this case was a 65 year old, uh, Mr. Zhang, he didn't want his first name used, um, who had moved back to his, his uh, childhood neighborhood and was trying to reintegrate. And um, he felt like he was not really part of the, of the local government anymore and, and, and had to try to find his own place. And at the same time, they had already had participatory budgeting going on um, in their province, um, but there was the public participation was really lagging. And um, he ended up uh, getting involved and they with the WeChat, he again, he, he was somebody who had been pretty sophisticated at technology and he became a trainer. And we this this new WeChat interface really boosted the um the, the degree of public participation to a great degree. And we told the story through his eyes. Um, and at the end, I'll give you a link so you can all read these stories yourself and see how it played out. But we, I always, the way I structured the stories, I always sort of started with the problem. I started with him. Then I went way back and I talked about all these different processes and then came back and ended with him about how it changed, how it's different now because of what we talked about. I'm sorry to jump in, Pam. We're, we've hit the 10 minutes. Right. Um, so if you'd just like to run through this very quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'll just end with two things to remember that they're good stories, but um, packaging really matters. Photography is important to bring it alive. You can see the difference between a faraway photo and um, the having, having strong partners who are really willing to share your content and translate it into local languages um, made a huge difference in this case. So yeah, thank you. I'll end it there. That's and fantastic. I'll do the link right there. If you want to go to that page, you'll find links to all these stories there. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Pam. We couldn't have asked for a better start. Brilliant overview. Uh, and there are some links uh, to the case studies in the chat as well. Uh, and a reminder, if you want to ask Pam a question, uh, you can put that in the chat as well. And we'll be speaking to all of our presenters once they've all presented. Uh, so that brings us on to our next 10-minute uh, presentation. That's subgrant two. Uh, and that's uh, Yossa from Technoloxia, which is all about a toolkit to help the global civic tech community fix common accessibility challenges. So over to you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So um, yes, today I'll be presenting to you Accessibility ABCs, the toolkit we worked on to kind of demystify in a way accessibility for the civic tech community. So the story started when we submitted the proposal uh, to um, try to answer the question, how can we lead and popularize uh, best practices when it comes to uh, accessibility and specifically for the civic tech community. So when we thought of a guide or a toolkit for uh, tech practitioners that are in uh, the civil society, we thought of how can we make it simple, uh, enjoyable, practical, community-based and accessible. We want it to be simple because we know that accessibility in itself could be a kind of challenging or a bit overwhelming for some people because it has so many technical details and even for technical people it could be like different from people who work on the software and people who work on the design etc so we wanted to make it simple enough but with enough information to get started enjoyable we wanted our um uh, community to enjoy looking into the guide and like find it in a way appealing we wanted that everyone after reading the guide or uh, listening to it would check and think of ways they could apply the tips they learned actually, right after after uh, checking the guide. And yet you have those thoughts on those like, like bubbles in your mind, oh, I couldn't do that. And then we want also to be based on the community knowledge. Um, we learn more from each other, but we also, as people who work in the civil society, we know more our the challenges we face and maybe the, also the, the gaps in our knowledge. And of course, uh, a guide on accessibility can be uh, not accessible. So of course we thought of accessibility and how to make it easy for everyone to check it. So to do that, we um, consider three main points. So first the content, what content would be appealing for the civic tech community in particular? 
um, how can we um, make the format or the presentation of those that content actually uh, um, uh, interesting? And how can we deliver it? In what format uh, we want to deliver it uh, and make it like accessible for everyone? So first, it was all about the content. How can we translate this concept of digital accessibility? Are we going to speak about one specific side of it? Are we going to speak, speak about maybe technical points in particular? How can we um, translate this concept without being overwhelming? And for that, we actually went back to the community. We thought this guide must be community centric. So we uh, worked with a focus group on actually a couple of sessions where we ask the, those people um, that come from the civil society, maybe uh, some of them actually, we met them when doing trainings on digital accessibility. Others were more actually um, people we know that had uh, uh, civic tech uh, projects in, uh, in our community. And we asked the question, how can we help you make more, your products more accessible? And what do you want to learn if you, like if you could order um, a guide or like, ask directly, have someone consulting you directly on that, what you want to learn. And that helped us actually have sort of three use cases. We want to be practical again, so we uh, went ahead and built those use cases. Some of them were quite from the imagination. We tried to make them like, uh, try to find the story and to tell and how can we implement uh, accessibility. And some of them were actually from the those projects our participants work on one we're working on. So one of the projects uh, one of the participants had was actually an online course for civic observers for the elections. So if you uh, maybe you know uh, during the uh, during last year Tunisia had an elections uh, many elections actually legislative and uh, etc. So um, many people from the civil society were working on the observation of the elections the uh, um, uh, education of the observers etc. But little to know people thought about how to make this process in itself, not only the day of the elections, but also even like participate in it accessible for people with disabilities, for instance. So we took that use case uh, from that one side, but we also wanted to translate to people working on online courses, for instance. How can you make your online courses more accessible? Um, so I'll leave you to, uh, to check uh, what tips we, we actually uh, recommend it for, uh, for people working on such projects. The second use case was on a harassment reporting platform. So it was kind of platform where people could just send uh, um, sort of um, incidents or alerts on when they get harassed, et cetera, in certain places. And that's kind of projects we saw a lot in many uh, countries, in, for instance, in Egypt, in Jordan, et cetera. We saw those kind of projects. Um, but one of the challenges was actually how can those reporting platforms be accessible for people with disabilities, whether it comes to how they could report or um, speak about their uh, incidents. Uh, so again, we had a lot of uh, recommendations. They are in no way uh, uh, 100 that, well, things that would make your platform 100% accessible, but those are sort of stepping stones and things you can uh, rely on at the beginning to make in the future better progress. We sort of believe in the compound effect when it comes to digital accessibility. And the last uh, use case was about fact-checking platform. And the idea was if you want to make a local fact-checking platform collaborative for everyone, how could you translate that that content actually you make is also uh, accessible for uh, for everyone uh, using your platform. And this also translates not only for this particular use case, but again, we thought about it as a way maybe to raise awareness about even our civil, so, so, social media uh, posts. How are they being really uh, accessible for everyone on uh, the Internet or not? Are we taking uh, the extra time maybe to put the alt text when we post images, etc.? So those were uh, kind of... Um, um, entry points for us to discuss those uh, tips. And then we worked on the format, of course. So we worked with an illustrator who actually um, went and tried to put those use cases and the whole guide in a appealing way and translate it in different, uh, in different uh, illustrations. It was even uh, interesting as well to, to try to make it, yes, appealing, interactive, but at the same time, make sure that it's accessible, that we are taking uh, into consideration the contrasts, et cetera. 
And as we did that, Tara, we have uh, our accessibility uh, guide. So the accessibility uh, abcs.com is where you can find it. You can find it in um, BTF format, uh, but also in audio format. And also on the uh, My, My Society uh, website, you can find it as web pages as, as well. Uh, so I advise you and would love for you to go ahead and visit accessibilityabcs.com. We believe that we want to make it a larger project in the future as maybe why not make it an online course in itself and try to um, reach more um, tech, uh, uh, civic tech practitioners and try to um, make it uh, again. Um, again it, it, this guide and every guide is uh, only useful if we share it and if we use those tips. So again, we made it in, uh, you can listen to it uh, while maybe on your run or uh, uh, and uh, maybe have a glimpse on how uh, on what to expect through uh, the audio guide, accessibility APCs. And today we also continue actually uh, to use it even on our trainings. Um, at the end of the guide, you may find a list of resources from previous projects, actually, of uh, um, other organizations from around the world. And we hope that this guide is, will also be an entry point for many trainings, but uh, hopefully also in other languages in the future, where it's, it intrigues people to start their process in digital accessibility. Thank you again for your attention, and please uh, reach out to us if you uh, want, have any feedback or uh, extra information. Um, this work wouldn't have been uh, possible without the collaboration and the feedback. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Yossa. That was terrific. And uh, you can see the links to that guide uh, in the chat as well. And if you've got any questions or any reflections, do feel free to add them in the chat as well. Um, we now go to subgrant three uh, for a 10 minute presentation, uh, and that's Open North on uh, access to information and specifically data quality. So, Christian, over to you. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my slides. Okay, and uh, everyone can hear me, see me? Yes, okay, I see Gavin. Cool, so let's begin. So hi everyone, my, my name is uh, Christian Medina. I work for an organization called Open North that is based in Montreal, Canada, uh, but I am currently located in Bogota, Colombia. Um, so we came across uh, the Action Lab uh, for a while now, and we had participated with Tech Tech uh, events in Lisbon and we're um, going to Reykjavik, but um, pandemic happened. Um, so uh, we've been following the program for a little bit and then when we saw the opportunity um, to participate uh, with the small grants, we uh, thought it was a great idea because we, we had been thinking for a while too on, on how we, we best support uh, capacity in government, in civil society, in frontline organizations, especially regarding data. Um, so our area of expertise is on research and solution design for technology, uh, capacity building and network collaboration. And we work a lot on data governance, open and shared data, smart cities, uh, public consultation, open government. Um, so to us, it, it aligned very well to be able to, to find a solution on, on how to access uh, data and data that's good quality, in particular in the service of the different activities that civil society and civic tech organizations undertake. Um, so that that's uh, we put together an application, we put together a project team, and and we uh, were successful in our mini grant uh, with my society. Um, and yeah, that, those are my coworkers, so Tom and Lucas. Uh, shout out to them because they. Uh, I, I was just a prince, so I just told them what to do. They did most of the work. That's that's how it works often, right? Um, so once we started thinking about this course, we wanted to really emphasize um, several aspects that we bring to a lot of our capacity building activities elsewhere. So we wanted to uh, emphasize uh, when creating the course that uh, we wanted to raise digital competency over literacy. So uh, literacy would entail a, a one-way intake of information. So uh, just people telling you what to do while competency is more focused 
on building those skills necessary for you to engage um, in uh, digital divides, in technology, in access to data, in, in all these challenges that are present uh, currently. Um, and in order to do that, we really emphasized the co-creative process with the Action Lab. So we had a couple of, of, of workshops with, with, with members of, of, our, um, of our particular challenge of the, of the third Action Lab, I think, uh, was the number. Uh, uh, and really try to hone down on, on what were the needs on the ground, uh, what were kind of the if the course and the thematics we were building were resonating with with uh, activists, with civic tech practitioners in the field, all over the place. And I, I see Richard is in the crowd too, and he I, I remember he contributed uh, uh, a few inputs as well. Um, so that was the process and the methodology that was behind it, um, and. As an organization based in the north, we're really, really aware of, of, of the power dynamics. So we, we we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just a course that was built in the north and that people in the global south would um, just absorb, but that it really was needs based. Um, and that that goes to the point of the global case studies. We really tried to uh, leverage the action lab uh, to find those case studies to to be able to uh, frame them in in the processes that of what good data quality entails and, and how to access that. And, and then the value add for us was that we were able to easily integrate it into our existing course platform. So we have uh, courses that, that what we work with uh, communities and with government and with civil society um, on a lot of other thematics uh, from data management to smart cities to an introduction to artificial intelligence. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this fit within that larger um, curriculum that we have available. Um, and that's that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, the, we call it the ONTRAC, the Open North Training Center. And those are courses uh, freely available to everyone. And, and since we're based in Quebec, uh, in Montreal, that's the French speaking part of Canada, uh, a lot of our courses are bilingual English and French. And then I'm trying really hard to get them in Spanish, but that's another battle. Um, so when it came down to the course, we quickly realized that you needed three components. So originally our mission was on accessing good quality data, but um, we quickly came to realize that there also needs to be a capacity building effort to assess data that exists already. Uh, and how do you know if a data set that uh, a government puts out or a private or organization puts out or an international organization puts out. Uh, how do you know the data is reliable that you can use it for your purposes, whatever those may be. Um, and that also led us to, to really coming down to everyone being able to speak in the same terms. So there's a lot of, of, of jargon that gets thrown around. Um, one that comes to mind is, is data governance. That's one that we've come across very often that, that is becoming very popular. So what does it entail to be data governance? And there are some misconceptions on um, is data governance data management? Is it more related to democratic governance of data sets or is it about power relations? So being able to showcase and, and agree with a global community uh, that this is what we mean by data quality, this is what we mean by data assessment. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned previously, we, we quickly realized through our work with the Action Lab members um, that there needed to be a, a capacity building effort to understand what entails good quality data. Um, yeah, and then so we built a course uh, through, how long did it take? So about three months, I think it took us to, to, to make the course and the course is fully accessible to anyone uh, who wants to see it. We uh, define what data quality is. We have user scenarios, uh, key terms. We uh, aim the course at, at civic tech practitioners. Um, and what was most interesting about undertaking this very collaborative uh, kind of co-creative process is, is that it really left a lot of lessons for us uh, when we think about developing our other courses, when we think about um, what are the needs in the global community um, especially if, if we're thinking again uh, on the impact we can have at a global scale. So um, these are some reflections that we had about after developing the course and you know, in an ideal world with a lot more time and funding, uh, we thought there, there definitely needs to be further efforts on capacity building. 
Um, especially on the data front, I think um, there is a lot of want to use data for good, to use data to advocate, uh, to use data to inform stories, to inform decision making. Uh, but there's not enough capacity and or a lot of the capacity is concentrated on very few individuals that um, have to work really hard to, to make this happen and they're strained and, and, and don't have a lot of resources. So um, we know that that part of capacity building that's tailor-made for different needs that, that can entail synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, so syn synchronous being at the same time with uh, a facilitator and asynchronous being an online course that you can take at your own time. Um, the same as, as even though there's wonderful um, ways to learn online, um, I think that in-person elements also missing, particularly uh, when it's more hands-on, uh, practical experience and, and challenges that you're facing. And the same, uh, both a very short course like the one we did, it, it wouldn't take you more than an hour to take it, and same more long-term processes where um, there's other elements such as a community of practice, like the one that TikTok is, or peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges and mentoring that can be done. Uh, I think there's room for both. Um, something that was quite interesting for me and, and from like a very personal perspective, as I mentioned, I live in Colombia, so um, there's this uh, focus on activism that, that, that really came forward from some of the members of the Action Lab, where um, sometimes you might be operating in a confrontational context where government or others don't want to release their data set or purposefully obscure data. Um, and same with authoritarian and non-democratic contexts, it's easy to work where there's an open data platform, but what if the data doesn't exist or the government doesn't want to release the data? So uh, we touched a little bit on this with the course, but given the limitations of the modality, we couldn't really dive deep into how do you access data and how do you share data in that context? Uh, and finally, as I mentioned before, some of the data and tech skills, how do you govern data, uh, how do you structure data so it's easy to use, so you don't, you're not spending five hours in front of an Excel sheet trying to figure out uh, X or Y, how do you make it standardized, and how do you build data partnerships, how do you uh, collaborate with other organizations working in your field or in your area that also need and want data. Um, yeah, so that's 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 kind of some of the reflections and the course we developed. I uh, encourage everyone to to access the course, to take it, and to explore around our different courses if, if you think you, it, it would be helpful for your needs. And I know questions will happen later, so um, just ignore that slide. And then yeah, free, feel free to reach out. And um, thanks again to the funder, to NED, to Tic Tac, to my society, to Rachel for um, putting all this together. And Gavin, of course. <laughs> Thank you. You did all the hard work, uh, but that was fantastic, Christian. Thank you very much. And again, uh, you can find the link to all of that in the chat. And if you've got any reflections or questions, uh, do put them in there as well. Um, we go now to a presentation on subgrant four, uh, and that's Fundathion Multitudes on storytelling and reach. And I think we're going to Stephanie. Yes, hi, how are you? So I'm going to make the presentation. I'm so sorry for the background noise, <laughs> but I'm currently uh, in a work, uh, work, co-work space. But I'm very happy to be here with all of you. One of my colleagues is here too, Victoria. We led this project called Training and Storytelling and Reach for Civil Society Organizations. We are an organization based in Chile, and we seek to close the gap between citizens and decision making. Our three pillars are education, monitoring, and also advocacy. So this project together with my society was very important to us because it was a way to give tools to civil society organizations so they could get their stories uh, to a broader audience. So the objective of this project was to provide civic tech organizations with effective tools to get stories about their projects and successes into mainstream channels. One thing that was very important to us was to have uh, organizations from different parts of the world. We had 10 participants from Indonesia, Macedonia, and the Philippines, as you can see in the map. And uh, Fundacion Multitudes is based in Chile, yes, but we have a representation in different countries of Latin America. For example, right now I'm currently based in Lima. Victoria is based in Buenos Aires and our team is in Santiago. So that's why the world map has 
all of these dots and it was really interesting to see how we could connect each other. And the trainers we had were Pauline Ibarra, our executive director, Evelyn Perez, founder of We Are Mass, and Katia Pet Petrikevich, that is the international director of Participation Factory. And these three trainers were uh, in charge of giving sessions on four main topics. There were the media mapping and media tracking with Paulina, press kit, press kit and media management with Evelyn. How do we elaborate with this course editorial line and expressions on contingency with Evelyn too, and design of a maker action plan for a specific program or campaign with Katia. As you can see, there's a flow between these sessions and the idea was that at the end the organizations will have all the necessary tools to develop their own communication plans according to their own needs as an organization and also according to their audiences because as we know the global north and the global south latin america and asia have very different needs and what we wanted to do was to give them what they need so they can develop their own strategies so we also had this, uh, after giving the sessions, we had like one-on-one -on -one interviews with the participants and also uh, Google Forms to collect their feedback from the program. And what we got was that uh, they joined the program because they wanted to develop an attractive uh, campaign for their organizations, meet and share experiences with other organizations and learn about storytelling tools and strategies. What was very important for them was to connect with other organizations. They were really interested in getting to know the work of organizations in other parts of the world, particularly about organizations that were facing similar situations, but in other regions. For example, our participants from Indonesia were very eager to learn more about Latin America. So um, that's why the hands-on part of these sessions was what really interested them the most. Some difficulties that, that we had with the program, and I think it's very important to share this, is that the time of the year was really challenging. We were at the end of the year, so we were working with December and January with the holidays. So sometimes people were um, late to some sessions, but still because of the interest, the interest they had, they were really engaged um, during the sessions. And also what was most relevant to them, as I already mentioned, is sharing experiences and best practices with others. So they were really interested in learning more about case studies. And some modifications for future trainings are to have into consideration the time of the year and also to uh, put more focus on the practice of of how to put these tools into practice with some workshops, for example. And also they were really interested about knowing more about, about artificial intelligence and how they could use it in their own uh, projects, for example. And regarding project sustainability uh, from Fundación Multitudes, we are making sure that we keep uh, the connection with these organizations. All the tools we use, the presentations from the trainers, the recordings of the sessions are available for them. Also, we will uh, launch a bi-monthly follow-up newsletter with relevant information on storytelling and reach, grants opportunities for them, and the stories of successful experiences. And also through our mailing list, participants will be connected in a, so they can exchange information about the project and also uh, to share how how are they doing with the communication plan that they were able to to have some insights on how to do it with the last training with Katia Petrikevich. So that's in a nutshell um, the project. Thank you very much to my society for the opportunity. And also we are very happy to answer any questions you may have. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Stephanie. Um, keep an eye on the Tic Tech website where there will be links appearing to some of those resources in the near future. And again, if you've got any questions for Stephanie or any of our, our other presenters, do pop them in the chat. Uh, we're going to go next to a 10 minute uh, presentation on subgrant five. Uh, that's over to the Demography Project on driving impactful societal change. And I think we're going to Richard. Oh yes, uh, good evening everyone from Kenya. Uh, my name is Richard uh, from a community-based organization in Kenya called the Demography Project. I'll quickly take you through uh, our project that uh, we ran through uh, the Tech Labs 5 uh, subgrant. 
uh, what you can see is uh, just a small collage of uh, the activities that you are able to undertake uh, under the um, thematic area of climate action. And uh, my presentation will pretty much be an overview of what we achieved. So, um, so during uh, the so a bit on uh, the demography project again, like I mentioned, a community-based organization, uh, and we leverage a lot on citizen science, uh, civic technology, and data journalism to empower communities. Now, on our project, uh, our project was uh, primarily on um, water conservation. That is having communities take charge of water resources that in within their areas and uh, having communities actually put steps or take actions towards not just conserving the fresh water but also the water the general fresh water resources including rivers wetlands and other um, sources of water so uh, we had uh, five key objectives and these were all aligned towards uh, civic action and uh, community engagement and all of this uh, was just mainly towards having communities again take charge of our uh, how they can conserve water resources and having them build resilience on uh, climate action and uh, I'll be able to elaborate further on why Kenya is actually in a very bad situation right now. So uh, the scope of the project is that uh, we wanted to use uh, civic uh, technology and uh, integrate it uh, with citizen science and having communities use this as a basis for how they can go about uh, water conservation. So amongst this uh, was to have a water calculator. Uh, we have 81 water service providers in the country and unfortunately Kenyans do not generally do not have awareness of how water is built and what goes, uh, what financial resources go into establishing uh, water infrastructure. And this is a similar situation across many sub-Saharan countries and other areas around the world. Uh, we also wanted to look at uh, regulations on water as well as uh, rights uh, uh, surrounding water resources. And uh, we wanted to integrate this uh, with community engagement. That is having vulnerable communities uh, uh, be empowered with information and awareness on how they can go about uh, water conservation. Um, water distribution is a serious issue in Kenya. Again, I'll be able to elaborate further on that as we go forward. And uh, we also wanted to see how we can uh, integrate it uh, with the Internet of Things and using universities as change agents, that is universities and university students as change agents towards uh, climate action. Um, so that is the team that I had. Uh, myself, uh, Caroline, Lillian, and Ronald, who should be on the call uh, from our, <laughs> from another room. So um, again, how bad is the freshwater situation in Kenya? Um, the photos that you can see of one river, and this river flows through just 200 meters from our, our office right here in Kiumu village. On the left, the water there comes from our, our wetland, the second deepest in Africa. And where it's, uh, the source is, the, the water is fresh, it's uh, clean, it can be used for various uh, uses, uh, agriculture, domestic use, etc. But on the right, this is just 20 kilometers from here, just past Nairobi city. Uh, it's passing through an informal urban settlement and the water is practically unusable. It's black water, essentially. And it's so bad that uh, the communities there cannot, cannot use it for any other purpose other than use it, using it as a sewer. Um, Kenya is famous for quote unquote uh, flying toilets, and uh, this is something that this is the reality of how uh, water resources are being used in the country because communities do not know uh, how and uh, why they need to conserve uh, freshwater resources. Now, uh, Kenya is uh, uh, undergoing the worst drought in 40 years. We have over 11 million Kenyans facing severe drought, lack of water and food, and this is, has been uh, this has been affecting the country for the past one year. And unfortunately, drought situation is not because um, the sun is too hot, it's because water resources are not managed uh, effectively. So what we wanted to do is having uh, not just uh, the end water users, but also the, the um, uh, government agencies uh, take charge with regards to how fresh water can be conserved within the country. And uh, this is among the challenges that we've been facing, is of course, rapid population growth uh, within uh, the past 50 years we've grown almost 13 times uh, population size but again water resources are consistent um again looking at uh, the fresh water withdrawal kenya is notable you can see it uh, right here it's the one of the few brown countries on the map uh, kenya is going to be water stressed within the next two years and it's something that you're facing right now 
and this is all because the water resources that we have are not being prudently conserved or utilized effectively by communities so again our work was centering amongst uh, the uh, from our individual level domestic level then to the community level how can we uh, best uh, utilize our resources water resources um, again, uh, we wanted to, uh, to show how water co consumption has been over the past few years. So again, we just want to see how perhaps a domestic, from a domestic level, can we conserve fresh water resources? So uh, on to the milestones. Um, we are, we uh, recruited uh, eight um, uh, climate champions uh, who are on our call, and uh, they were practically, uh, we recruited them from uh, various universities and colleges across the country that they can be help, uh, able to help us conduct research from the various 81 water service providers or utility companies across the country, have them conduct that research and share with, and uh, help us share the message on water conservation, both at their own community level and within the university uh, uh, landscape that they, they attend. Uh, we had a very uh, big um, uh, response to our applications. We had about 794 applications, and you had to select the best eight from this. It was quite a challenge, since all of them had demonstrated a lot of insight towards climate action. Number two, we engaged a lot with uh, water regulatory bodies. Uh, due to various reforms within the industry, we have multiple layers of uh, actors within the water sector, and we had to engage each one of those levels so that we can have authorization and also having access to open data so that we can be able to interact not just with the data but also transmit it to the end water users so that they can take action towards our, our water conservation. Um, we also uh, supported a, a mapping, geomapping of various uh, uh, water resources within the country. It was quite a task but we utilized uh, the support from our climate champions to do this and also within the resources, open data from our various partners to compile a, a, a holistic water atlas on our Kenya and this is uh, one of the outputs that uh, we had in our project. Uh, we also created uh, linkages and uh, memberships uh, within with uh, various uh, organizations and this is of course to amplify the voices from a local level to a global level on uh, water because this is a global issue. Without water there is no civilization so we wanted to use uh, the project, project as a platform for us to engage uh, with multiple actors both locally and abroad. Now um, Practically, we also uh, installed, uh, using uh, the Internet of Things, we wanted to, ins we installed um, water level, water level monitor on a, on a water tank. Uh, these are ubiquitous in Kenya. Practically every household has a water tank because, again, access to water is a bit limited, so we need to con uh, save water from a domestic level. So I wanted to see how the Internet of Things can be able to show us, uh, provide us with insight on how perhaps you can be able to conserve water and practical measures on how we can reduce our consumption. Now, we had uh, various uh, events, or uh, we participated in planning of various events, and these were all towards uh, raising community awareness on uh, um, water conservation. Uh, we had the World Wetlands Day on uh, 2nd of February, and ahead of it, uh, we had a conservation run for Ondiri Wetland, uh, again, the second deepest in Africa, and we gladly host it with our, in our community. So we had a conservation run that had about 850 participants, Kenyans run. So we used this at a, as, a, 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 as a tool for us to enable communities to understand the role they can have uh, within our water conservation, not just from the domestic level, but now going up to the uh, community level. Um, on our World Wetlands Day, uh, we were able to uh, hold an event at uh, one of our informal urban settlements, and uh, this is called a Korongosho Slam. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, home to over 200,000 Kenyans, and they are at highest risk of uh, um, waterborne diseases and lack of access to water amongst other opportunities. So we worked with a community-based organization there to hold uh, the World, World Wetlands Day event. And uh, following this, we were able to host the President of Kenya, His Excellency uh, Dr. William Ruto, who was able to see how the youth themselves can be able to spearhead or catalyze uh, change with regards to how we perceive our resources and our general environment. So this is something that we are very proud of. 
um, we had an innovation challenge that I just concluded uh, last week. Um, uh, this was uh, just to have engage uh, with uh, universities and university organizations, have youth propose ideas on how we can go about solving three uh, solving challenges facing the three three uh, SDGs uh, on hunger, water, and uh, health. Uh, this is still ongoing. We are we are supposed to have the award ceremony in the, of uh, the next week. Um, also, we worked uh, with uh, again with the stakeholders within the water sector, so that uh, we can have communities participate in not just the licensing but also approval of various elements of public participation surrounding water. And this includes uh, water tariffs, the cost of water, and also the availability of water. Uh, this we've been doing over the past uh, three months uh, with the various uh, water service providers, and we are hoping that I uh, will be able to sustain this not just from a journalistic perspective but also having communities participate in uh, these processes. Um, uh, also, we, um, installation of uh, meteorological stations. Um, this is uh, to support communities or within not just universities but also vulnerable communities uh, perhaps take action or uh, gain data with regards to uh, climate action so we is, we are in the process of installing three uh, uh, meteorological stations small compact ones um, affordable ones that the communities can be able to use to broadcast perhaps uh, the weather quality and most importantly the air quality because air and water are linked we wanted communities to take that action so that you can have them use this data and you show how perhaps practical action can be taken to mitigate um, uh, excessive uh, pollution of the environment and uh, its negative effects. Uh, lastly, uh, we have an open data portal. And uh, now this is a culmination of everything that we've done, uh, all the photos, the events, everything. Now here, we, uh, we launched it uh, last week uh, during the uh, open data week. Now uh, we shared insights on how uh, Kenyans can take practical steps towards uh, conserving fresh water and all of, um, we are looking at all elements including uh, signing petitions uh, with regards to re legislation and policy action towards water conservation as well as linking and water users with various levels of uh, government uh, agencies dealing with water so it's a whole complex issue water is such a complex issue it's uh, something that we learned through and it's one of the challenges that we faced it's such a complex sector and yet we were able to achieve a bit uh, through this project um, so those are a few photos of uh, what we did uh, we are engaging directly with communities and we are happy to engage directly with informal urban settlements and rural communities uh, sharing with them messages or engaging with them to understand just how um, our the, the small steps that we can take and be able to conserve the freshwater resources that we have. Not just the rivers, not just the water within our taps and within our households, but also having communities understand the general effects of water upon civilization. So it's quite a complex topic, but we are able to do quite a bit over the past three months. Uh, we really thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, my society, and with support from NED, we are really, truly grateful for this. Uh, those are our contacts for uh, the team. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Richard. Um, a huge amount of work and so much to pack into 10 minutes as well. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. And again, there are links in the chat uh, if you'd like to learn more. Um, we now go to our final 10-minute subgrant uh, presentation. That's subgrant six. That's Policy Lab Africa on civic tech in hostile environments. And I think it's Charles. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gavin. Um, pleased to meet all of you here. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I wanted to say thank you to um to my society for this um, grant six um, that we had. Um, my name is Charles. Um, I represent Policy Lab Africa um, based in Lagos, Nigeria. And um, 
I wanted to share um, a little bit about our project, which is the Election Violence Tracker. Um, it's an open source uh, reporting tool that we built. Okay. Let's see. Uh, sorry, I think my. Can you hear me? I think my system. Yeah, I can hear Okay. Come in one second. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, my system froze out a little bit. So um so the challenge was to be able to, according to the, the grant, uh, we had the opportunity to apply um you know for this call for proposal and um and the challenge was to be able to build an, you know, an open source platform, you know, that kind of advances, you know, civil causes. Um, it will be digital, of course. And um, so we kind of, uh, you know, took up the challenge. Um, so one of the problem we identify, you know, going to into the Nigeria elections was that um, the independent, you know, National Electoral Commission of Nigeria um, have about. Uh, 176,974 polling units, and uh, we have about registered voters of about 97 million. And uh, you know, we looked at the data and we found out that the polling units are like addresses. You know, you can imagine like in rural areas um, that these polling um, units have just you know names. You know, you can't locate them on a map. Um, anywhere. So it becomes a challenge for election observers, um, you know, civil societies, law enforcement, or anybody, you know, like we have, you know, diaspora voters this time around. Um, the election in Nigeria, uh, especially this year, has a lot at stake. And, um, you know, we needed to find a way to kind of, um, uh, you know, help out, you know, in some way. So, um, that's by the way. And uh, another thing we kind of thought about was that um, Nigeria recorded, you know, violence, um, heavy violence in the elections in 2007, 2011, 2015, and 2019. And the issue is that if it happens in the remotest parts of the country, it means it is underreported and nobody kind of knows about them. We don't know the scale. Um, of those, you know, violence, you know, um, from people losing their lives to, um, you know, burning properties and stuff like that. So, um, so we, so, so, so this is majorly the, the problem. And how do we come about it? So we kind of conceptualized um, an open source reporting tool that will enable citizens to document and report, you know, violence incidents during the elections. Um, that was what it came about. So how does the election violence tracker, you know, works? So what we thought about was um, we wanted to create, you know, a, a platform that if you are in your polling station or your polling unit, your local government or your ward, and you experience any violence, you go onto this platform and you report it. You upload an evidence such as a picture or an image and you upload it. Once you upload it to the platform, um, we have a bot that kind of shares this on, on Twitter. So um, other people on social media can kind of, you know, engage, you know, you know with the content and discuss the issue. So, um, but, uh, but the major um, issue was, how do we kind of know where um, you are coming from? How do we, the the um the polling unit data from the electoral body has no addresses. So first of all, we have to use OpenStreetMap to revalue locate the polling units. You know, um, we did that automatically. We also did it, you know, manually. So we're able to get the longitude and latitude and kind of put them on a map. So when you send, um, when you now send a report and you take a picture or a video, it kind of attacks attaches a geotag on it. So we know exactly where you are sending this from. So we don't need to kind of ask you, but we know where you're sending it from. So that confirms with the original data that you inputted. So um, it is um, IP locked and geofenced, so you can't um, upload or send anything outside Nigeria. 
So that was uh, um, what we did. And then uh, we also used, um, you know, leaflets to kind of visualize um, the data for the report. So when you send uh, us a report, um, it, is the, it is processed and kind of put on a map. So we have categories, you know, for different kinds of, you know, incidences from, from gun violence to, to arson and, you know, you name it. So that is how the ele election violence tracker works. So to report a violence, I mean, this is how the UI um, for platform looks like. Um, you're able to kind of fill out the information. They are not case sensitive, um, but you can give us as much information as possible. You describe the incidents, you upload your evidence, and then you submit as simple as that. This goes to our, our back end. So this is how it looks. Once you put in the report, it looks like this. You could provide video. Um, you can also, we also have option to kind of record from, from, from inside the app. So this is how it looks when you, you report an incident. Um, then after reporting the incident, we need to be able to see how the data looks like, you know. Um, so to assess the data, all you need to do is to come here and search um, for the state, the local government, the polling unit or the region. And you click it, you could be able to see the map of Nigeria and see the various you know, violent hotspots. So you can be able to click on each one to be able to expand and see the number of cases and the different types of cases and the, and the cases that it looks like. So we have a report uh, you know, dashboard you know, that you can download and export. So, so this is um, how it looks like. So you have different kinds of cases. You can download this data. You can share them. You also have a narrative here about the incidences and how it happens. You know because people put you know narrative you know you know um, behind their their descriptions of the violence. Okay. So what we achieved, you know, within two months, um, we were able to build a tool to independently create, confirm, and track you know violence you know incidents. Um, we also think that this is a good data resource, you know, for journalists, election observers, activists, and the civil society. You know, um, they can be able to use this to be able to. I, I don't think that um, there is very low um, uh, accountability, you know, during our elections, and uh, this has become a tool where people can kind of look at and see um, where the hotspot, and you can look at this and see that the commercial capital of Nigeria, where is the um, in during the presidential elections that happened a few weeks ago was the battleground, and that was where most of the violence, about 70% of them happened on that platform. Um, we kind of enabled online and offline, you know, reporting, you know, making it a progressive web app and having service um, workers implemented. That means even if you're in the remote part of the country, you can still upload the data. Once your internet connection comes in, it now comes onto our database. Um, all our codes are open source, which means it is reusable, you can remix it, you can reuse it any how you want. Um, the impact, I, I think we already deployed it um, for the first phase, which is the presidential elections on the 25th of February, and it was successful. Uh, 25th, 26th, or 7th, there was elections um, for the presidential elections. Um, we collected 59 reports in online mood while six reports were saved offline at some point, you know, during the reporting. Um, we are now finalizing um, the minor front end changes, you know, that we discovered, you know, during um, our first round of, uh, you know, live testing. And, uh, and uh, we've, uh, we've, we are now working on them to be able to, and we are looking set to be able to deploy again this Saturday on the 18th and 19th of March for the state and um, assembly elections. Um, what is next for us? We have, um, we mapped 176,000 polling units. I mean, that's a huge amount of data. I mean, that can be used to do anything from census to, um, to doing any project related to um, the environment, um, anything related to GIS, you know, because we have this now mapped. It's on our GitHub um, repo, and you know this can be remixed and used. So we are kind of calling on our partners, you know, within Nigeria that can make use of this data in any other way to solve some problem, which we welcome. Um, we are looking to in uh, 2023, um, 23 African countries will be conducting elections. 
and uh, across um, Africa. And uh, we are also looking to uh, somehow, you know, get involved, you know, with our code, we can easily kind of deploy any mapping solution to there. So we look at, uh, you know, countries, uh, you know, within the West African, you know, region. Um, we have Congo DRC, um, we also have Liberia and Sierra Leone um, having elections in the next couple of months. And we are looking to, you know, get involved and be able to build um, some kind of solution. And maybe we could begin to see um, an African-wide, you know, electoral violence um, map. Um, we are not just looking to just map, um, you know, this violence, but this kind of goes back to the a conversation about, you know, our, um, our moral, um, you know, responsibility and how our democracy, um, what democracy is all about. And also kind of not just um, reporting this incident, but trying to also find a way that um, we can try to stop them, you know, before before they happen. So that is how what we are looking into within the next phase of deployment. When we want to go to these African countries, we must find a solution to making sure that we kind of limit these things before they happen, and also kind of um, uh, minimize um, misinformation and fake content, you know, that is happening on the platform. These are the things we we want to solve. But we are looking forward to working with um, partners across Africa that want to use our data to be able to build something interesting related to election violence. Um, so yeah, we are Policy Lab Africa based in, in Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, we are Policy and Advocacy Think Tank. Uh, we work with technology um, you know, to build a sustainable digital future for all. Try and check us out and check the electoral violence um, tracker out. Thank you very much uh, for your time. I look forward to, 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 to hanging out again with, uh, with all of you. Thank you to Tic Tech for the opportunity and uh, every one of you that supported us uh, during the feedback and the demo. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Charles. Um, and again, you can see the link uh, to more information about the project in the chat. Um, we've got just under 15 minutes now to put some questions to our fantastic uh, presenters, Pam, Yossa, Christian, Stephanie, Richard uh, and Charles. Um, did I mention everybody? I think that was all six. Um, I'm going to kick off with the question. I can see a few have already been asked and answered in the chat. Um, but I think one question I had for everyone, obviously one of the aims of um, Tic Tech Labs was to try and build the civic tech evidence base. I wonder what are the sort of biggest lessons um, that you've taken away from all the work that you've done? Um, maybe something that you would do differently next time or something that you'd wished you'd known at the start of the project. What would you like other people to take away? Uh, what lessons have you learned? Uh, I don't know which one of you would like to go first in answering that. Maybe nobody would like to answer that. Christian, go for it. Yeah, okay. I can. Um, yeah, I, I guess as for us, it's it's a little bit um, kind of balancing the expectations of, of, of we want to do a lot of great work, but but it's it's very the format is is limiting because um, you know we're a nonprofit, so it, it, no, we can't invest as much as we would like. And then uh, look, we did end up investing a lot more um, than, than, you know, than the parameters indicated at first. So, so it's something that, um, well, I don't know how to negotiate it because we're very happy with the end result, but, but internally it's like, oh, well, like maybe he took too much of Tom's time. So um, that's for us. Right. I will, you, Pam. I will say something, yeah. I, I, going back to my focus, I, uh, writing stories like this takes a lot of time because what I found is that we don't really think that way in this field. I mean, we don't think about the ultimate beneficiary. I mean, it, you know, it, we really do have to remind ourselves that ultimately, I mean, that's what actually I go back to the name of um, my organization, People Powered, you know? I mean, it, we think of the people more like it, who's all doing the work and the process. Um, but to think it's almost like following a, a chain of breadcrumbs, you know, all the way to why we're doing the work. We're doing this because why? Um, you know, it, it, it is to some ultimately approve something for what we call like the ordinary person. But we don't often we're not a, we often aren't aware of who that is. We're so some of us in our organizations are pretty far removed from it, you know. So 
as I worked with each of the partners who are doing the work, um, I found that sometimes it's, it's actually really hard. So I, I take the Chile example, for instance. Um, we were able to identify the young man who, who participated in the project, who, but to actually get down to the person he helped, <laughs> you know, um, that was like really hard to do. They hadn't thought about it that way. And it takes a lot of time to, to, try, to, to try to do that. So you have to allow, we definitely didn't allow enough time, <laughs> you know, um, uh, especially when you have, when you're trying to, to talk to all, all the different players that play a role, because you want to recognize the fact that a lot of different people are involved and are sometimes left out of the story, um, it takes time. So yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing for me was like, wow, we did not, <laughs> didn't, leave, didn't leave enough time for it. But also it's really important to do it. Um, like I said, it, it, let's not let the process over, overwhelm the end benefit. Brilliant. Thanks, Pam. Um, I'll let um, our other presenters come in on that question. But again, if you've got any questions for our presenters, uh, do pop them in the chat now. Yossa, over to you next. Yeah, so um, for us as well, uh, the challenge was at the beginning that we wanted to put it all in the guide, like to put all the information we, we have to, to respond to all questions or maybe um, different, get uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds and even folks group it was quite different to uh, quite difficult to actually choose who to include and if we have enough representation etc so but then after taking a moment back or like let's say a step back we thought like okay if it's this big wall we have to look at it one brick at a time and try to um respond or way uh, even if we can't have all the responses, maybe just guide people to those uh, who may have the responses. And at the same time, another thought we had is that at the end of the day, it's also as much as it's important to provide direct resources, etc. It's also about making sure that the message in itself is not lost. So one of the messages we had is actually at the end of the day is to make the extra effort and um, make sure that you are put an, um, put an accessibility in mind and thinking about it in different steps of your in your, of your project. So yes, definitely um, with the resources constraints, with the time constraints, it's very important to not forget that the message after all is the most important. Excellent, thank you. Uh, who'd like to go next? Richard. Yes, thanks, Gavin. Um, amongst the various challenges that uh, we had, uh, of course, for us uh, was uh, engaging directly with our communities, uh, be it the university communities. And by the response that we had, we had a very large outpour of uh, interest and support in this. And uh, filtering of what you would want to work with has been quite a challenge uh, because, like I mentioned, uh, the water sector is quite broad. And this, it's similar across all countries and uh if you focus on just one element you'll find that it's a bit cross-cutting the theme the the various themes in climate action are all interlinked and for us to settle on water it's because of the prevailing circumstances kenya is in a drought yes but uh after the rains come uh we and uh, we are glad that it's currently raining uh we are hoping that uh, it's ab we are able now to link this up uh, with various uh, uh um initiatives on climate action and uh it's something that uh, various actors that we were working with uh, were able to reflect the same that you may not be able to more to focus precisely on what the solution needs to be so we really just had to spread ourselves thin just learn as much as possible and see where we can uh, intervene for the first three months so possibly as we scale it up we can be able to address more issues in order thank you excellent thank you um stephanie or charles i'm not sure if you've got any uh, anything you'd like to say on that question as well uh yeah thank you i'll go ahead Sorry, Charles. Um, I think we mentioned it briefly on our presentation, but uh, one big challenge we had was um, the time of the year. Also, as you saw, we were organizations from different parts of the world. So the time zone was very difficult to, to find. But after talking with the organizations, they were OK with the time zone because it was early in the morning or at night so they had time to participate not in their work office hours but uh, having these workshops 
on December, the last week is maybe when organizations, civic tech organizations and civil society are working on their final reports or the planification for next year. So it was really difficult for them to maybe engage fully in the session. So that's one thing we should keep in mind when planning other types of training, like the time of the year. And also to put more um, focus on, on case studies, not case studies, but just showing them, but also to probably maybe invite some speakers that have like in-ground experience, on-ground experience about putting in practice these kinds of tools. They were really eager to know more about how to implement them more than just theory. They were more interested in practice. So I think those two observations are one of our most important learnings for, for us. Fantastic, thank you. And Charles? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think reflecting back on uh, what we've done, um, I, I think that um, we operated like a startup, um, you know, looking at the amount of time that we had. Um, so it was uh, purely kind of uh, um, technical stuff. Um, it was uh, scary at the beginning because we looked at it and we had uh, 176,000 polling units to geolocate. I mean, you know, you know that was um, a lot of work. And um, so we had very little time for, um, for consultations, for co-creation, uh, you know, with the wider civil society. And that is uh, very understandable. Um, we did, uh, you know, what we did, uh, we got the results, um, you know, that we wanted. We built um, a very useful solution. And um, when we put out our work and had, uh, you know, meeting with partners that would help us to, you know, disseminate this, um, you know, we had lots of feedback. Um, we we built the we built uh, we had uh, an MVP, you know, like um, a couple of weeks even before um, the, the the deployment, you know, time, um, you know. But we didn't uh, um, do consultations, you know, at that point. It was after our deployment, our live testing that we started to get feedbacks on 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 what to fix, and they find out that um, fixing a bug uh, might take a quite longer time, you know, than what you already kind of, you know, built. So a, a lot of things here and there that we are supposed to kind of, uh, you know, consider. For example, um, we did, uh, we, we kind of uh, made an illustration, an, an infographic for, um, for sexual related violences, and we made a mess of it, right? And uh, when we sent it out, someone pointed out uh, to us that this is not, uh, you know, proper. You know, as techies, uh, you know, working, um, you know, that was something we didn't really kind of uh, put a lot of consideration into. So, I mean, you find out that uh, um, it, at that initial stage, a lot of consultation could have, you know, solved, you know, many of these issues out. But, but yeah, I think uh, um, it's good to also kind of be in, in, in that sort of uh, you know learning mood we are kind of uh, happy to kind of learn and collaborate you know with others to kind of improve um how we use technology to kind of solve you know um you know civic issues uh, but i'm glad it all worked out we're, we're kind of uh, learning we collected a lot of feedback you know um last time we did demo and many of them were kind of fixing you know one by one and seeing how everything goes so i mean if we do it again i think that um you know Proper planning and consultation, even if with a small group of people, is kind of uh, you know um, very very important. But um, but also um, the tech and the data involved might might be scary sometimes to people in civil society because I mean at that time many people were not building um, tech solutions for for the elections. Many of them have built it um, a couple of bones back. Right. So, but we kind of took on the challenge and knew that this will be out in time. Nobody built anything from January until until February, but we started officially kind of start, you know, making roads around January, and that was, you know, um, record time. Um, so, thank you guys. Yeah. 
Thank you for that, Charles. And thank you all of our presenters uh, for those excellent presentations and those really interesting and insightful answers as well, because I think, Charles, you're talking about learning mode brings us on perfectly uh, to the next and final session of the event today, uh, where we're going to get some reflections from uh, our steering group members uh, and from Louise as well. So uh, we're now going to be joined by uh, Louise, who you've already heard very briefly from, the Chief Executive of My Society, and two members of our steering group, uh, Isabel Hu from the Open Culture Foundation and GovZero in Taiwan, and Matt Stempek, who's technologist in residence at Cornell University and founder and director of the Civic Tech Field Guide. So thank you all uh, for joining us today as well. Um, I'll kick off with the first question to the three of you, which is, what do you think went well about the Tic Tech Labs program and what were the highlights for you? Uh, Louise, do you want to go first? Happy to, yeah. Thanks, Gavin. Of course, having come from a series of such stellar presentations, I have to say that uh, the quality of the work that has been done is phenomenal. I think uh, there was a comment in the sidebar about the amount of work that's been done and that that has been uh, really impressive too. And I think listening to the presentations, it's interesting to hear how that idea of trying to come together as a community and identify common challenges has worked because the problems don't stay in their own lane. So as the presentations um, really illustrated well, there are communication challenges and storytelling challenges across problems, data across projects, data access challenges across projects, questions of hostile environments. So I think that that um, choice of problems uh, collaboratively feels like it's worked really well. Brilliant. Thank you. And of course, some of those problems were chosen uh, by our steering group. Um, Isabel, do you want to come in next with uh, what you thought went well and your highlights of the program? Oh, yes. Um, thank you for having me here. I learned a lot from all of your projects. And it's 11.30 in the evening in Taiwan now, but I'm I'm very awake with that because I'm over, overwhelmed by all of your results. You don't you you have done wonderful and inspiring uh, projects, and uh, I believe these projects will have much more impact in the future because uh, I think all all of the civic society can learn very very uh, much from from all of these projects, and uh, um, as for the um, uh, the Tic Tac Labs, I would say I see um, the comp companion through the whole process is very uh, went well, and also the collaboration between uh, my society and the project uh, participation uh, participants, and also I see the commitment for all of you who joined in the project. So. Um, Oh, I think this is a wonderful process and to get the best result we can help, what we can expect. Thank you very much. And Matt. Thanks, Gavin. Hi, everyone. Matt Stempek. It's great to see so many Civic Tech super friends on this call. Um, congratulations to all the grantees on the excellent work. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm based in Lisbon and actually first came here for Tic Tech. So if you ever need an evaluation point for the program, there's one. Um, uh, the, so I think my favorite things about this program, first of all, the fact that it exists, that my society was able to quickly shift its flagship event budget towards the subgrants program, and not only do that, but create an open methodology that my society is already refining, that people are giving feedback on throughout the process. I find that really admirable. Um, and then I was also just a highlight for me was uh, that the funding went to driving very concrete work in this space with very clear outputs uh, that sometimes even much larger grants don't achieve because, you know, for various reasons. Uh, and then lastly, just that we saw really global, much wider participation than in-person events can usually allow because of travel costs and visas and stuff. So even the program, the projects that weren't selected, it was really great seeing just a global reach of civic tech in different places. Brilliant. Thank you. I have a few more questions for our panelists, but if uh, all of the rest of you on this uh, call have any questions as well, please do drop them in the chat. Uh, and the same goes for any reflections that you might have of your experience of the programme as well. We'd love to hear all of that. Um, so I suppose my next question, and I might uh, go in reverse order uh, this time, is 
one of the aims we had for uh, Tic Tech Labs was strengthening civic tech networks and the exchange of ideas. And a few of you have already mentioned sort of importance of collaboration as part of, of as part of the project. So how, how well do you think um, the project, the program contributed to that aim of strengthening networks and sharing ideas? Should I go first? Reverse. Cool. Um, I think the surgeries were particularly good for this, uh, seeing who's doing what and exploring the theme together before getting into all the other part of the process. And then just, I mentioned, you know, seeing where the rubber hits the road in terms of, you know, real life projects out in the world. And the example I thought of was like, we spent 15 years talking about the potential effects of AI and those are important conversations, but this year it's like happening. And it's a much different conversation with an actuality that you can point to versus theoretical conversations. and. These projects are very much, you know, real things in the world, and we can see how people respond to them. Great, thank you, um, Isabel. Let's go to you next. Oh yes, um, I think first the the theme of all the uh, the sixth theme of the surgery is uh, well selected. I remember I just checked the meeting minutes of our first uh, kickoff uh, kickoff meeting of the steering committee. Um, there are, I, I think, nine different uh, nine different subjects. But I, I think my society staff just merged it into very um, smartly, <laughs> but into six different uh, things. So, and uh, all of this thing that I think it's um, uh, the civic tech uh, communities care about globally, because uh, although there are a few, uh, I find that few people uh, from East Asia to join the um, the uh, this uh, the lab event but uh, actually when i communicate and I collaborate with the uh, um, com community in east asia like in south korea or japan all of these uh, issues are what we care most especially like the uh, storytelling and also the data quality this uh, all of this are uh, very important and um so i think um, based on the same uh, the the subjects, we have we they actually learn a lot from uh, people from different corner of the in um, in the earth. And uh, for me, I have uh, I I I don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to to uh, to know better from of uh, about the people from in, uh, South America or uh, Africa. But um, during the uh, the past two years, uh, I just um, know I just know oh there are so many people working very hard in those parts of the world, yeah. So I think this uh, contributed to broaden my eyes. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Very glad to hear it, uh, Louise. Thanks. Yeah, I think one of the things I would throw into the mix on strengthening networks is thinking about how the structured approach with common themes worked, because I think it's brilliant to see civic tech grow and become very diverse and lots of different projects develop. One of the challenges that brings is finding the people who have common concerns with you or are interested in the same problem that you're thinking about now. So it's it's the problem of kind of finding the right people to answer the questions you have at any given point. And I think the surgery lab piece of work actually worked pretty well in allowing discussion of problems that actually led to a, a concrete result, as Matt said, but also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, making sure that the, the end piece of work was as informed as possible by other people's perspectives. And I think if, if we want to get the most of the projects we're building, you have to think about that tricky question of context and how might you reapply the ideas, if not some of the approaches or code. Thanks. And that probably brings us very nicely on to the next question. I'll come to Isabel first for this one. Um, another aim <laughs> that we had was the development of new initiatives and collaborations that expand the civic tech evidence base, address issues and challenges facing the sector, and enhance the effectiveness and potential impact of civic tech projects. How well do you think the program met that a nice short question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think this will be uh, very impactful because uh, 
first of all, of, of all the, the, the process is well curated. And I, I think it, that could be uh, reused, reused in the other projects. Like uh, we have this uh, in, in Taiwan, in Gavdero community, we just started um, um, projects for ed education for the younger generations about civic tech um, or pro uh, project-based learning. So I think the whole the project the the process uh, the sur surgery action lab and then maybe some demo would be a good process for for the this kind of education projects. So we can learn from this and that, that would be impactful. And also I think um, the documentation of all the uh, tic tac uh, labs is very important thing because we can always revisit what happened and uh, what what ideas were shared, was shared during the process. So um, I think this uh, all of this documentation will be will make the uh, projects uh, be more impactful than um, before because we can see through how these things uh, is achieved. Achieved not only the only the results but also the process, and I hope uh, ChatGPT will help the staff to 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 do this, these jobs uh, um, easier in the future. And because I think they you you must uh, spend a lot. Rachel and uh, uh, Jake Gaiman must spend a lot of time to do this. Yeah, for the documentation. Yeah. Thanks. And as you say, as well, all of that documentation is on the Tic Tech uh, apps website. So do take a look through all of those minutes, lots of ideas, lots of other resources uh, that were shared as part of those meetings as well. Um, Louise, I might come to you next on this one. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, on collaboration, I think uh, it's a, a really good question. And I think somebody commented, it, it feels like we're sort of halfway through the story here because a lot of these pieces of work feel like they have uh, been designed by the lab participants and by the people who picked up the grants to enable the sector in various different ways. Either there's uh, a, a, an opportunity to learn from stories of other pieces of work or actual resources, concrete pieces of um, tech that can be reused in some cases in, in quite broad contexts. So I think the story of collaboration is interesting. It's the collaboration that comes down to the piece of work and then the story that happens afterwards once the piece of work goes into the wild. And as Isabel says, I hope that the that's where the kind of the resource curation element comes in so that in the future people can find the things that they need to maybe contact people. And I know Matt has a lot of history in trying to do this work. So perhaps I'm teeing you up for your answer to that question there, Matt. I appreciate the pass to the net and sports sports analogies. Thank you, Luis. Um, just first on the evidence base, um, I was really impressed with how much action and results we see per dollar or pound invested here. And I think that's in large part thanks to the hard work of the grantees um, and the strong theme selection. So just that catalyzing effect of these micro grants to get projects off of wish lists, whether those are new projects or deepening existing ones. I think that was a, a pretty great evidence base expansion effect. And then, yeah, interconnecting the field is like the whole reason that I do the Civic Tech Field Guide and help people find projects like this. Um, so, I was, when we talked about this earlier, I was excited to see the collaboration that took place even outside of the formal program, you know, and I think my society has survey results about this, but thinking how we can better interconnect the field. And as a recovering American, I always appreciate the chance to look beyond immediate national borders to who's doing very, very similar work in other contexts, whether that's, you know, geographic or, you know, um, topical silos. So just on that note, all of these projects are in the Civic Tech Field Guide, and um, I've updated them with today's call that will be live tomorrow. And pointers, the Tic Tech Labs blog posts are really great for background on the projects, and those will all be there in an evergreen way. Uh, so, so they're findable forever on. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, there will be an opportunity for anyone else who wants to share their reflections on all things TicTap Labs, uh, program, projects, process uh, in a moment, but I will ask our um, panelists one final question uh, before I let everyone else uh, put their hands up. Um, you've already heard the question, I sort of put a version of it to up to 
version of it to our presenters as well. Um, what do you think we could learn from the programme and how should we take that learning forward? And I might go straight back to Matt, then Isabel, and then give Louise the difficult job of summarising all of it. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'll try to keep it concise. Um, at the risk of sounding totally corny, I think the value of the unexpected community that was built in this process was important. So the direct formal partnerships, but also just seeing who's doing what. And um, we talked on our, our private call earlier about just knowing you're not alone in doing this work, even if at the local level where you work, you might actually be the only one who cares about this, just knowing that others are working on the same theme, including in hostile contexts. Um, so seeing the diverse approaches to similar challenges while at the same time finding that community I think that that's just huge. And so this is the fellow travelers thing. And um, then just also I mentioned before the methodology. So, uh, you know, people really liked the ability to have repeat engagement on the theme and the ability to, you know, keep working on things uh, over time rather than one-off events. And I, I think that's a great area for exploration. So combining that with the ability to have those hallway conversations that we talked about, uh, with, you know, more focused thematic areas would be pretty cool. Um, and then just, uh, yeah, I think keeping track and whether it's in person or published for the brave, like knowing what didn't work too is such an important area that we try to follow. And sometimes it's easier shared in the hallway conversation than on a blog that your funder might see. But in one way or another, just, you know, we're trying to see what's working, what's not in this space so we can, you know, all have better results for our work. But those were all the highlights for me. Thanks, Matt. Isabel. Yes, I, I, I think um, for all the six uh, projects just presented, uh, I, I learned from all of, all of this. And uh, because I think most of, most of them are open source to and, uh, uh, or CC licensed, I, I think they could be reused by other civic tech communities in, in, in other countries. Like um um we have this we offer these uh, online courses for the um broader uh gen general uh, public uh, during the summer we have this online summer camp so maybe we can translate some of the courses made by uh open no open notes yeah uh, about the quality of data uh maybe we can do this so they could be reused and I think all of the projects um. Um, hope, uh, owners could be uh, could, could be a mentor to others pro to other projects, and uh, I think uh, we should keep this um, community to to be together, like maybe through Slack or other mechanism, or maybe meet in person in physical in in person uh tic tac, yeah. So um, I think. Uh, we should try to uh, make the best use of all of the all of your work and uh, amplify the impact of this uh, project. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And Louise. Yeah, I I too have learned a lot just uh, reading and hearing about the the work that's been done in the projects as a as an organization. I think we also try to think and have tried to think as the program has gone on about how we lay the groundwork for collaboration and my reflection there is you can't engineer collaboration so as, as you mentioned it, it some of it happens outside of the formal structures and that's great but how we can use a structured online format to maybe lay the groundwork and allow people to identify areas of common interests and then go off and, and hopefully collaborations flourish and people learn from each other's work. But also that question, and I think it came up in one of the presentations of how you mix in person stuff back in with online approaches and, and use them together. I think that that's a really interesting question to think about as we we go forward into the the hybrid world that we're living in now. <laughs> indeed thank you uh, all very much and um, we do have some time left so does anyone else on the call whether you were involved in any of the projects whether you've come to um civic tech surgery whether you've been on an action labs tiering group or whatever does anyone else have any reflections 
they'd like to share or indeed any questions um, that they'd like to put uh, to our panel or anyone else. Uh, you can use the raise hand tool, which should be under reactions uh, down on your uh, Zoom toolbar, or you can uh, put something in the chat if you prefer. Anyone have anything they'd like to share? What happens next? That is an excellent question, Christian. Um, Louise, shall I throw over to you for that? Yeah, Christian, good question. Uh, so um, I think one of the uh, questions we're thinking about immediately is uh, how do we get the most value out of the work that's already been done? So uh, I mentioned before, it feels like we're halfway through the story of some of these pieces of work. So I think actually making sure that we share as much as possible and enable the sharing of what's been done is an immediate concern over the next few months. In the slightly longer term, from my society's point of view, I think we are really interested in um, developing this work, uh, bringing together people who have common interests in a structured online way, but perhaps, you know, as I as I just mentioned, uh, mixing in getting together in person in some form uh, and having those kind of uh, serendipitous interactions that happen when you just start chatting to people about work, which uh, I think can be a little challenging in online formats. And also thinking about that question of um, how we share the difficulties as well as the successes as a community and, and kind of really learn from those as well and whether whether we can kind of help people do that definitely interested in hearing your thoughts though if you have a perspective on what you would like to see happen oh my yeah i'm a very a pie in the sky kind of thinker not pie in the sky but blue sky kind of thinker but um, definitely, I think um, for us, it's an interesting modality. And, and I used to be, I used to work for a funder for the Canadian government. So um, I know some of the funding constraints that exist, but um, I think it's a very innovative modality for organizations that don't have a lot of resources and money to be able to um, kind of say like, oh, it would be nice if I could do this, but no big funder is going to give me money for just one course or no big funder is going to give me money for just one line or, or like a series of lines of code to develop a tool. Um, so I really enjoyed that um, aspect of it. I think it, it does spark a lot of innovation. It's something like with the data quality, we have been thinking for it for a while. We just we just couldn't fit it into any of our other programs. So when we saw it, it's like, hey, we, we could do that for 5,000 Canadian, that's, that sounds reasonable. It, it really helped spark sort of that innovation. We're really glad to hear that. Thank you. And we've got a really good question that's just come in the chat from David Newman, which um, picks up on a lot of these themes as well, which is where would people go to set up communities of practice and who would facilitate? It's something we've been asking ourselves uh, as well. I don't know if any of our panel uh, would like to put forward an answer to that or any reflections on it. Um, in the interest of uh, reuse, there's lots of great groups that are currently sort of jump jump starting to get back up and running after COVID, you know, killed a lot of our meetups and community spaces. Uh, but they are getting back in action, various brigades and code for all groups. And, you know, um, as usual, we track those here. So if you just check out, um, <laughs> we have a whole section called meet the others. And that includes we separate in person meetings and online forums and slacks and kind of all the places you might talk with people in this space. Um, so that's, if you want to reuse, that's a place you can start with, but I also understand that, you know, we want to keep this tic tac conversation going and, and that community of practice thing might be a new thing. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, anyone else want to come in on that one? I guess I, I could just comment that I think there's two ways of doing communities of practice kind of discipline based which um, maybe you could view this program as, as fitting into that. So thinking about sort of cross-cutting concerns, I think there's another interesting approach, which is thinking about civic tech projects. So what you're trying to do at a higher level, is this about access to information? Is it about uh, water access, climate? What's, what's the kind of overall goal? And therefore, 
aiming to get together with a community in that respect. And then I think the cross cutting concerns fall out of all of those as well. So it's not a very practical answer, but it's just something we've been thinking about in terms of different ways of, of helping people gather together. Right. Uh, anyone else on that or any other just final reflections on the whole thing? Yeah, about the community, I would like to welcome all of you to join the GovDero Slack. So there are many people who is interested in CBTAG from all over the world. And we have an English channel. And I think and uh, um, I think we will host a, a GovDero Summit next year. So I will try to find some funding to maybe invite uh, some of you to come to Taiwan to share your projects with us. So I, I think that's one of the things uh, we, we can try, the GovZero community can try to do. And uh, also I would like to uh, maybe contact some of you uh, about how to collaborate with your uh, projects, uh, about your projects, because uh, there are many of uh, many similar projects in the GovZero community and also in the East Asia civic tech communities. So we can share more information about that. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we're nearly at the end, but final chance if anyone has anything they want to say or anything they want to ask before we leave. And again, you can see some uh, links going in the chat, uh, including about how to join the uh, GovZero Slack. Well, if there's nothing else, and I think all that remains for me to say are quite a, a, a few very, very big thank yous. First of all, to our fantastic uh, presenters today. It was really fascinating to hear about all the incredible work that you've been doing on what is quite a small budget. It really is remarkable just how much you've got done. And as Louise was saying, um, we know there's still a lot more that could come from, from those brilliant foundations. So thank you for today, but also for all of the hard work that you've done uh, through the project. Um, a huge thank you to our panel uh, as well. Really insightful conversation and uh, obviously to our steering group members um, thank you for supporting us all the way through and helping choose those topics and everything else that you've done as well um, big thank you to the National Endowment for Democracy for funding uh, a lot of this work uh, a big thank you from me as well to the brilliant team at my society you've heard from Louise today um, to Rachel and to Gemma without whom none of this would have been possible I know so many of you will have interacted with them during the course of the project and they've done a fantastic job but also to the entire team at my society uh, Miv Asha, Angela and others um, who've given us support all the way through. Uh, and a final thank you um, to all of you um, for coming along today and for all of your support uh, throughout the Tic Tech Labs programme as well. So a huge thank you. Do keep an eye on the Tic Tech website. Uh, there'll be more details of all the projects coming up. And uh, maybe we'll answer that question as well about what happens next and uh, how we can all come together again. So a huge thank you for coming along today. A huge thank you for everything and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.